Welcome home. We are WNST. Joss of Baltimore. Baltimore Positive. We're going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with Liberty Pure and Jiffy Lube twice this week. We're going to be at Costas on Tuesday from 11 until 2. I've got some confirmed guests. We're going to be talking about Key Brewing over there. We're going to be talking about life on the peninsula. We're also going to be talking about the baseball season. Orioles play at 2 o'clock against the Red Sox. Hope to see you out for that. Also on Friday, uh, Luke will be joining us at Fadley's. We'll be live at Fadley's from 2 until 5. Uh, first time we're going to do this this season. We're going to do it each and every Friday that the Orioles are home. So if you are making a Friday Oriole home plan, plan to join us at the new Fadley's at Lexington Market. Stop by, say hello, take a selfie, have a crab cake. Um, it'll be delicious. Uh, also, uh, get yourself a Maryland Lottery scratch-off. I'll have the Pac-Man scratch-offs by Friday. Luke Jones joins us now after um, – you and I have had some really crappy weekends in Pittsburgh, right? With bad weather and, <laughs> you know, warm beer, you know. Um, I, I Look, I go back to 79 with this. An interleague play still a little weird that we actually play up there a little more often than maybe we used to play up there, which is once a decade or whatever, once we did. Um, you know, we can talk cold weather. We talk all you want. Bats, throwing the ball around, kicking the ball around, um, you know, created for a sloppy weekend. And, and – it is amazing how fans, um, baseball fans specifically, they sit around and they pine all winter, lose a couple of games, and everybody's freaking out. And everybody from Norfolk's got to come up now. And we got to get rid of everybody. Um, week and a half into the season, Luke, they're, they're not undefeated. Imagine that. No, they're not undefeated, and uh, there's nothing to press the panic button over. At the same time, they got to swing the bats better. I mean, I, I I remember back to opening day, and you were almost – dismissive about the idea that you know they're just going to score a lot of runs they're going to hit the ball this year and I didn't disagree with you but since those first two games where they scored a total of what 24 runs they've scored 23 over their last seven since then it's not good enough I mean it's just not and the juxtaposition of that with what we are seeing at Norfolk right now which is incredible some of the, I mean the numbers are video game type numbers uh, that the Tigers like little off. league numbers when I looked at it I mean, Heston Kerstad already has – he has like 26 RBIs already or something like that. I mean, it's crazy. It's like Chris Davis. They're going to call him that... up May 5th, and he's going to lead the league in RBIs through the All-Star game. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know about that. But I, <laughs> but this does speak to the talent they have at AAA. And I, I think while certainly I'm not of the mindset to start making changes right now, although certainly, you know, if you want to tell me you want to bring up Jackson Holiday, I'll listen to that. Uh, but – it speaks to the overall level so of competition. So his agent would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know but that's going on too, right? Oh, yeah, it, it is. But we also – we know what's going on here, and they weren't going to bring him up the first week of the season when, when they do that. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot more competition in this organization. And if you're someone like Austin Hayes or Ramon Arias or Jorge Mateo, you know, guys that aren't necessarily being viewed as long-term mainstays in this organization uh, at this point in time you got to play you got to perform uh, if not then we will be having a different conversation in, in the coming weeks and months so uh, you know is it look they're five and four it's nothing to be overly concerned about uh, on that front uh, i think the big picture concerns for this team are the same that they would have been two weeks ago when we talked about this. You know, we're still talking about the depth in the starting rotation. We're talking about the depth in the bullpen, missing Felix Bautista, uh, wondering if they have enough guys that can miss bats in the back end of the bullpen. And we saw uh, Yenier Cano work his way into a, ma a major jam. And Gunnar Henderson almost made a spectacular double play to win it, but throws the ball away and they lose. But, you know, overall, five and four. It's nothing to panic about, but they do have to start swinging the bats better. And more specifically, got to start swinging the bats better against left-handed starters. And I know they've had an unusual run of lefty starters that they're, they faced here over the first three series of the season, but you know, you've got to, you've got to perform. And certainly some of the guys in this lineup that you, know, you expect to perform. Okay. But other guys where there's someone at AAA knocking and waiting for an opportunity Hey, you got to get going. I mean, it's not just a case of Ramon Arias has a really bad batting average. It's not hitting the ball hard even. Uh, Austin Hayes, same thing. He's bad batting average, and the exit velo and, and all the other peripheral numbers look really bad too. So, you know, it's it's a bad start for some guys. That's, you know, if it's the first week and a half of the season or the sixth week of the season, 
you know, everyone goes through a slump. Uh, everyone's going to go through that at some point, but it's a little more magnified early on. To your point, after a, a, an entire winter of waiting for this to start, it's almost like we need to retrain our brains every year to say, okay, small sample size, just a few series. Yeah, things could be better, no doubt about it. You know, you kind of look at how the first series went against the Angels. Great, right? Win two out of three, first two looked awesome. Uh, against Kansas City? stole a series. Uh, I mean, if we're going to be totally honest about it, you know, uh, two walk-off wins uh, to win two out of three, and then you go to Pittsburgh and, you know, they just, they got, they have to swing the bats better. Uh, yeah. I mean, Especially there are the other first six innings, right? Uh, yeah. Literally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you know, I mean, you're talking about uh, the, being no hit, you know, uh, the, the first four or five innings of, the, of some of these games or being in that territory. Uh, you know, you look at what happened Saturday. I mean, you know, you got, Got to swing the bat a little bit better. Sunday, they get an outstanding performance from Dean Kramer on the heels of their bullpen happened to work on Saturday, and they scored two runs. So I, I'll hear it, and it wasn't just the offense, to your point. You know, a couple of those runs were unearned on Sunday, but at the same time, I'm I'm looking at the the, the aggregate here. I'm looking at the, the end result, and they're not swinging the bats. I mean, they're just not scoring runs. Uh, if you take away those first two games of the season, the, the offense is really bad uh, since then. So, well, you can uh, say the same thing about the defense. They flashed some leather, and then they've kicked the ball around. I mean, they've made some great plays. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the defense overall has been fine. I mean, I, it's been, but it's been choppy at a couple points. There's no doubt. I mean, Dean Kramer was guilty of it on Sunday. Threw away a double play ball, right? And they end up scoring an unearned run as, as a result. So, you know, you're going to have some of that. I don't expect the other areas of the game to be perfect, but when you're you know, barely averaging three runs a game over a week's time, yeah, I mean, that that's going to be the big focus for me. That's going to be uh, where you need to get going. And uh, you look at this lineup right now, once you get past the top three or four guys, and, and you know, Gunnar Henderson, a little, little bit of a slide here over recently, but he's going to be fine. Uh, but once you get past those top four or five names in the lineup, it's been a struggle, uh, and and it's been ugly. I mean, like I said, I mean Austin Hayes. It's not just that the ball's not finding grass; he's not hitting it hard. Uh, Ramon Arias, same thing. It's not just that the ball isn't finding grass; he's not making hard contact. So, uh, and you know, it's those two guys right now. I'm not trying to pick on them, but at the same time, you do have all these players at Norfolk who are doing what they're doing and putting up numbers. Albeit it's Triple A pitching, I get it, but. Uh, it speaks to the overall level of competition, and there are very few guys on this roster. Even though it is a, a team that's coming off a division title and 101 wins, there are very few guys on this roster that I'm going to look at and say, well, they're on scholarship. Whatever happens there, like, you, you just shrug your shoulders, right? I mean, so uh, you know, guys need to pick it up. The weather hasn't been all that uh, cooperative, but the other team's been dealing with that, with that as well. So... Uh, you know, we'll see what happens as, as they go to Fenway Park. And typically Fenway can be a place where your offense can get well. Uh, but the Orioles certainly need to be ready to play and uh, go up there and uh, finish this road trip on a high note after a disappointing weekend in Pittsburgh. Uh, Luke, I want to talk bullpen with you because the Kimbrel signing in the offseason, you spent a lot of money, very out of um, out of the norm for the organization, right? I mean, just against... Against their salary cap, they've spent 20% of their cap on a closer they didn't use on Sunday because it was the third day in a row. Um, I'm not a guy to run guys out there and have their arms fall off. I mean, we've talked for a decade about Buck Walter renting uh, Matt Weider's knees, you know, at various points. And, and you've mentioned about outfielders, you know, 130 games for Austin Hayes, 130 games. I mean. Austin Hayes might not be on the, on the team. You know what I mean? Like he's got to hit the ball because to your point, these aren't footsteps. These are, you know, the Sasquatch is chasing you at, at Norfolk at this at this point. You're running through the woods and you're trying to stay in the big leagues and trying to stay your at bats because if he got pined here, who's dealing for him? Where do they put him? Do you put a slumping guy? He becomes Aaron Hicks, right? He becomes sort of damaged goods at some point with a much less salary than Aaron Hicks had last year, but he becomes that he moves into that category of guy, especially if you're bringing a dude up. You're going to bring a dude up who's going to play five days a week that's going to replace him. You're going to have a lot less at-bats. With Kimbrell, there's no replacing him, right? They gave him a lot of money. They brought him in. I'm not saying I didn't think he would be out there on Sunday because I was forewarned about a couple of days and pitches and all of that. But there is a point where you lose a game when your closer doesn't blow it and you find out that 
maybe last year's Yannir Cano is not this year's closer, and we all feared that. I mean, even at the All-Star game, we didn't – we saw what it was. It was a month, month and a half of exceptional, and then he's got to go back and be a regular reliever and get – figure a way to get three outs when he comes in. Figure a way to throw strikes. Um, and last year's a long time ago. In that case, Kimbrell, the closer situation in your mind – what were you expecting to happen here on the third day? You were you expecting Cano to move into that spot and yeah, yeah obviously I mean, shut the door, right? Yeah, I mean it's that simple. But I, I said the same thing last year. I'll say the same thing next year. You can't throw the same two guys at, at the end of games every, especially if you're playing really close games and you're not scoring runs like they aren't at the moment. You've got to have multiple guys that can give you meaningful late inning contributions. And, you know, Saturday, uh, I, people can, you know, well, why didn't they use Cano? Well, they used the rest of the bullpen. They wanted to have Cano fresh for Sunday in case they had a save situation. And they had it and he didn't get the job done. But you need four, you need at least three or four guys that you can really trust in those spots. And yes, you have a, a, a de facto closer, right? I mean, last year it was Felix Batista. It's going to be Kimbrell this year. Kimbrell at his absolute best at this stage in his career is not going to be Felix Batista. Uh, I mean, the, the crazy thing is you look at Saturday's game last year prior to the Batista injury. That's the kind of game we saw Batista would go two innings, right? He might pitch the ninth and he might pitch the tenth. I mean, that's kind of how it would work. And maybe that's in a big picture sense, part of the contributing factor for he hurts his elbow, but pitchers break. We're seeing that across the league. We're oh, seeing man. that. With, we could do a whole I mean, segment. I mean, everybody I mean, else in the world's doing a segment on that. Yeah. And baseball falling apart and Otani betting and the Oakland disaster that we're going to see in a couple of weeks out there. Like, I, I, it, it's baseball's getting a black eye here this week. I mean, well deserved if your star player a year into this is betting, you know, four and a half million dollars on the game with his with his bookie translator. Like, baseball's got. We have our own issues. We sit here every day, and I've talked to everybody the last week. How do we get people back to the games? How do we get people excited, really excited about the Orioles? Excited enough to spend $180 million on players, right? Let me get all of that. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of things going on with baseball, but this thing where young kids' arms are falling off, I mean, it's not like it hasn't come to our hometown. We didn't have a closer on Sunday because of it, right? It's not like it hasn't come to our hometown where the dude who was our Cy Young candidate last year, is, we're, we're waiting on him to take a knife. So... It's, you know, it's for Little League, it's for kids, it's for surgeons to talk about, it's for everybody to talk about, because my dad always told me, you can't throw a curveball till you're like 16, 17, don't do that, we don't want kids throwing curveballs, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just seeing over the weekend, and I did not see the source of it, but I, I saw a quote that, and, and again, it's the internet, so take some balls on that, but, and, you know, it was James Andrews just talking about, and, and it, I don't know if it was this I year. I saw that, the same quote, yeah. It, we we think about it so much in terms of major league pitchers, but the rise in recent years, and, and again, this isn't new to 2024. I mean, this is something that's been happening, and it's been happening more and more for a while now, but the rise in Tommy John surgery for youngsters. you know, And, I, and when I say youngsters, I don't mean 23-year-olds. I mean 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, where, where we're talking about some before they even get to high school. Yeah, you send your kid uh, but, to pitching camp when he's 12 years old. When he's 15, you're going to be sending him to the doctor. Right. Well, well, and I think what we're seeing is I think there was at least a mindset. And then we'll get back to, you know, I, I know I've kind of changed the subject here. But since since it's we're mentioning pitchers subject. and yeah. Felix Batista's absence is, is so massive for the Orioles right now uh, for, for 2024. And it doesn't mean they won't overcome, but it's a major challenge for them. Uh, and that was magnified over the weekend. But I think there was a mindset for the longest time that, and we talked about this a little bit with Bradish and, you know, whatever's going to end up happening there. The idea that you're not going to just jump to get Tommy John surgery because it's not a 100% return rate and success rate. Uh, but there was a thought that when a pitcher would have Tommy John surgery, long term, they would be okay then, right? You know, assuming you completed the rehab and you did everything you needed to do and you missed the requisite amount of time, there was a thought that, all right, your ligament, you know, reconstructed should be okay. And now what we're seeing is more and more pitchers having to get Tommy John surgery a second time. And we're seeing it uh, in some cases where pitchers had it five years ago and then they're going under the knife again and you're thinking about that timeline i mean that's scary you know if, if we're talking about 
uh, UCL reconstruction only lasting five years, and then someone's having to go under the knife again, go over the history of guys that have had Tommy John surgery multiple times. That That's not a good return rate. That's not uh, a, a, the kind of percentage where you're feeling good about someone getting back to where they were before. So, you know, I mean, Spencer Strider, the, the most recent, uh, obviously the you know, great, great pitcher, uh, you know, great arm for the Atlanta Braves. And, and, you know, some of these guys where they didn't have Tommy John surgery all that long ago, and, and now they're having to go under the knife again, uh, potentially. But bringing it back to where we're talking about with the Orioles and Batista, this this reinforces the, the point I was trying to make even more. You need multiple guys because you can't keep sending the same guys out there, game in and game out, and expect them to hold up. And, uh, I mean, I, I think back to last year, and I'm not even – this isn't even – a a suggestion or an accusation that the Orioles overused Felix Batista. Let me be clear about that. But how many times over the course of the first five months of last season, Nestor, when Batista would be unavailable, fans would be saying, you know, and not, not all fans, but you know, fans who were maybe a little overzealous uh, to quit very quick to criticize Brandon Hyde, where they're saying, why isn't he throwing Batista? You know, why isn't Batista Batista out there? Well, you see these pitchers break. And, and this is why when you have, an eight man bullpen, you need at least four or five of those guys that to give you high leverage and late inning contributions over the course of 162. I think we're seeing it early on. It really feels like they're trying to see if Mike Bauman can be one of those guys. We saw that on Saturday. He hasn't looked up to the task. Hey, dude, they brought kind of Fuji guy. into some situations last year when they had, you know, they sure. went and got him and they they had a 15 game lead and they're like, tonight, tonight we can blow him. And two or three times he did in July or August, right? Literally. Yeah, I mean, that's right. So, I mean, part of it is you have to find out. Now, on the flip side, I think Keegan Aiken early on, and again, we're going off of a little over a week worth of, of, of a sample. It's very, you know, whether guys are pitching really well, pitching really poorly, hitting really well, hitting really poorly, you know, that's still. Very, very, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, noise there uh, in terms of what's real and what's fake. But, uh, you know, Keegan Aikens look good. You know, he, he feels like he stepped into the CNL Perez role, uh, at least for the time being, and has done a, a good job. On the flip side, Mike Bauman, who it feels like they're really trying to see if he can be a guy that contributes to them for them in the late innings. It hasn't gone so well, you know, walking guys and putting putting himself in peril. So, you know, look, we talked about this Throughout the offseason, we knew as admirable as it was that the Orioles held on the way they did without Batista over the final month last year, doing that for a month as opposed to navigating an entire season without a pitcher, without a, a closer, a, a potential multi-inning option as Batista could be on occasion, uh, that's that's a lot to navigate. And it goes beyond Craig Kimbrell or how hard he's throwing or how well he's pitching. I mean, that's a collaborative effort. And it's why even two months, three months before Batista got hurt last year, we were talking about them still needing more bullpen arms. So look, I mean, it's, I, I think it's very clearly something that Mike Elias probably already know, not even probably he knows that they're going to have to add and it doesn't mean it needs to be right now or next week necessarily, but certainly by the trade deadline and getting deeper into the season, you're going to need another high leverage arm or two. And I, I think because we, you mentioned Cano specifically, you look at how he profiles overall, is he that flame throwing strikeout guy that Batista is or what Craig Kimbrell was for most of his career and, and you know, still is to some degree. I mean, he still struck out a lot of people last year. Uh, is Cano that kind of a guy? Not really. He's more of, you know, he's going to throw the change up. So he's, he'll miss some bats, but that sinker. It's going to beat ball the ball pitcher, into the ground. Yeah. Which is good most of the time. But Double when you play get, ball, usually. Right. But, but when you get into some positions, well, and, and, and let's be clear. I mean, I, I get it. Gunnar Anderson made an error and, and the winning run scored as a result that that wasn't a routine double play either though uh you know that was a tough that would have been a spectacular double play let's call it for what it was should he have put the ball in his pocket probably but you're still talking about a tie game there point is some guys get on base if you're not a pitcher that strikes people out yeah that, that's where you're you're at the uh, mercy of the batting average ball 
balls put in play gods, as some nerdier baseball fans might call it, the Babip gods, the Luis Gonzalez uh, uh, gods, is what yeah, you're saying. Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing. <laughs> no, that's I mean, a good but one, right? But it's the truth. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I saw a, a few people make this comment on Sunday afternoon, and I thought it was a fair comment amidst you know some of the more irrational thoughts. But flat out said, the Orioles probably need another bullpen arm or two that can miss more bats, get more strikeouts. You know, how do you get out of jams? The, the best way to do it is to be able to strike people out. You know, Felix Batista got into jams, but then he might strike out the next three guys and leave the bases loaded. So, you know, it's just, but I'll, but I'll continue to come back. I'll continue to come back and say, scored two runs on Sunday. Dean Kramer was great. And they didn't score enough runs. You know, I mean, it's that simple and I get it. The defense let down a little bit. Pitching let down with Cano a, a little bit late, but where did they let down a lot? It was on the offensive side. It's much easier to try to score more than two runs than to expect your defense and your pitching to be perfect late in the game. So, uh, you know, that's, that's where it is. And, uh, nothing to panic over by any stretch of the imagination. But at the same time, New York Yankees are off to a heck of a start. And you don't want to be in a position where you're, I don't want to say give away, giving away games, but letting some games that you have a chance to win slipping through your fingers, as was the case so over the weekend for the Orioles. We all talked about the soft schedule, and the Royals showed up with like an actual pitcher and like a world-class shortstop. And and then we're like, ah, it's Pittsburgh. Oh, they're good all of a sudden. Ah, the Red Sox. Yeah, they stink. Oh, we got to go see them. They're, they played well the first week and a half. Luke Jones is here. I will be at Costas on, on Tuesday prior to first pitch uh, at 2 o'clock against the Red Sox. Then on Friday, we'll be together down at Fadley's in the new Lexington market. You have not been to Fadley's in your life yet. Because you haven't been to the new Fadley. It's only been a week and a half. Uh, all new equipment, all new everything. It's beautiful. Going to have an all new co-host with Luke Jones. We're going to be doing it live, which is all in new. Two until five. We'll be giving away the uh, Pac-Man scratch-offs. I also have the 10 times the cash still left over from our cup of soup or bowl. The 25th anniversary documentary is coming out a little later on in the month. Greg Landry has been hard at work trying to figure out how to make sense of uh, my 40-year Media journey now on the air over 32 and a half years and now 25 going on 26 years here at WNST. Um, <clears throat> as the narrator says in uh, the 25th anniversary documentary, no one listens. Everyone hears we must be doing something right around here. We're going to continue the baseball conversation as well as some football. They still play that around here. We got liars luncheons. We have all sorts of things in addition to an eclipse. We are WNST AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking Baltimore positive.